church, my name is Kenzie and thank you for joining us today for VBF Online. You can visit our website at vbf.org to watch our latest sermons, follow us on social media and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you'd like to donate to our ministry, you can do so by going to vbf.org and clicking the Tithe Here tab, or you can mail in a check. If you have a God story you'd like to share, you can email us at share at vbf.org. Thank you for joining us today and we hope you enjoy the message. How is everybody doing? You look, you look good on the Lord's Day. Let's stand on our feet. I want to, I'm gonna give you a reminder. This is a reminder to somebody. Right now they're in worship. What the Bible says, you can give all your burdens to the Lord. And Jesus, what will he do? He will lift them off and he'll fill you with him. Let's pray. Father God, I pray in Jesus' name. Right now, Lord, give everyone the faith, the, the trust in you to give them your their burdens right now and fill them with your spirit lord anoint this worship anoint pastor josh and we thank you for what you're going to do today in the name of jesus amen
It's pretty incredible that we really do serve a God that is fighting for us right now, no matter what we're going through. God is fighting for us right now. So during this time of worship, I just want to invite you to just surrender because God is working in this place right now. All you have to do is surrender. So let's just continue to worship together and sing. We love you, God.
place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I
Lord. You may be seated, church. Good morning, church. How you guys doing? You guys doing good? Man, this weather can't make up its mind. But you guys are here, and we're so glad that you're here. Um, if this is your first time, we want to welcome you. We want to welcome everyone online as well. Um, but if this is your first time, we do have a free gift just for you. Again, it's a way for us to get connected with you. And uh, here, here's really what it is. We want to show you all the different families we have here. And by that, I mean community. There's so many ministries out here with, you know, they have their family. And uh, you can be a part of that family slash ministry. So don't leave this place without getting some form of information. There's a QR code behind me. You can scan that. And that's to stay up to date and connected just with everything we have going on. But real quick, I got a couple of announcements. And then we have another amazing worship song. So the first one is this. Pastor Ron will be back on Wednesday. Um, he's going to be discipling us in the series, Why We Believe What We Believe. So bring your Bibles out. Bring your notebooks out as we dive deep into this study. Again, that's going to be on Wednesday, and we hope to see all of you there. This one's for the ladies. You guys got a Derby Day party. This is your annual fundraiser for the VBF Women's Ministry. It's going to be on Saturday, April 27th from 11 a.m to 1 p.m. in Station 316. The tickets are only $20, and this is what it has. It's lunch, dessert, ayo, opportunity drawings, fun games, and derby attire. All of that for only $20, so you can go and purchase those tickets at vbfwomen.com. The Teen Challenge is hosting their annual barbecue, and uh, we're inviting you to it. So we're going to be there. Uh, we have uh, Pastor Ron Vietti is going to be the guest speaker. We have the VBF worship team going out there. It's going to be on Friday, April 26th at 5.30 p.m. And it's, uh, it's for a good cause. It's for a teen challenge. And so if you want to be a part of that, you can purchase tickets and by calling this number. It's 661-399-2273. And then we do have a Honda motorcycle giveaway opportunity drawing. That's a tongue twister. So this is a nice bike. This is a really good bike, and this bike can be yours. And so for only $5,000, I'm kidding. No, so all you have to do, all you have to do is uh, it's an opportunity drawing fundraiser beginning today. So you can go in the hub or you can go online and purchase tickets there. And we are going to, it's a 2008 Honda motorcycle. The winner is going to be drawn on Father's Day. So that's going to be June 16. And all proceeds are going to go to help just kind of fix up this campus a bit and uh, um, just everything that we have going on. So again, online or in the patio. I was kidding about the $5,000. Some people, just in case, just in case, it's not $5,000. So yeah, this motorcycle can be yours. And then we do have a plus one happening next Sunday. I'm excited about this one. If you've never heard of our plus one ministry, this is where you bring a separate offering of just one dollar and we see what God does with that dollar. We've seen incredible things happen. We've been able to uh, donate to or, or purchase um, clothes for kids who didn't have the means to do it. We've been able to purchase blankets and mattresses for people who were homeless. Um, we've been able to do so much with just a dollar. He stretches it every single time. So bring a dollar and watch what God does with that dollar. Again, that's going to be next Sunday. And then we do have a volunteer of the week. We have Alexia's house, everyone. She's amazing. She's been attending VBF for the past five years. She helps us out in the high school ministry. She's an amazing leader. She's very organized. Um, and as well as she helps out in the baptism ministry. So if you see her around, her and her husband, they do a lot here. Give them a high five. Encourage them. Say hello. Ask them how you can get involved. I'm sure they'll plug you in. And then last but not least, you guys know the drill. We have these purple baskets, a kiosk in the foyer. You go to our website at vbf.org or Mellichek into 2300 East Burnish Lane or text the word TIDE to 855-996-9555. But with all, that, with all that being said, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. And we're going to come and do what God wants to do in our life. And I believe he's going to speak to us. And so let's bow our heads and pray this. And it's Father. God, we thank you for this community. Father, we thank you for the fact that we are the church, God, and that you have purpose in our lives. God, you give us purpose. And Father, right now I pray that if there's anyone here, marriages, families, anything struggling, Lord, would you remind us that our strength comes from you? Would you change our perspective here this morning? God, and we believe that you're going to do it. We ask that you bless the giver, 
bless the offering and bless the receiver in Jesus name and I got to see what's that amen well come on let's stand up together impressive you looked outside saw the weather and said yeah I'm still going to church of course that's impressive seriously I, I am impressed because the uh, weather's nuts I can't figure it out it's like two days ago I'm wearing shorts and a t-shirt and then the next day I don't know man it's getting weird 
Sorry, I have all my stuff here. I gotta move it around. So, uh, as I told uh, last service, I'll tell you guys a little disclaimer. I uh, have this like respiratory thing where I'm coughing a lot, and so um, I will be. I, I have a cough drop in my mouth, and I know it's annoying. So I'm just gonna get it out there, so you're not like, "What is that?" You know, what's that clicking noise? Just tell you that that's what's going on. It's either that or I cough uh, hysterically, and I would do it right into the microphone, really loudly. So. Um, so you, I mean, uh, I know that, you know, there's germs and stuff and, but you guys are pretty far away. I think like everybody from the second row on is good. So those of you in the front row, you're in the, you're in the splash zone. You ever been to SeaWorld? It's like, yeah. All right. Anyway. All right. Jokes aside, uh, today is going to be heavy, but a lot of scripture. Um, it's called his last week in the city. Now, um, This is kind of like a message that probably could have been spoken before Easter, you know, Uh, because it's talking about the last week um, before he was crucified and uh, he was in Jerusalem during that time. But uh, truth be told, I had another sermon, a completely different sermon uh, planned for today. And then Saturday I woke up and turned the news on just to check and see what's going on. And I saw that Iran was uh, attacking Israel. And I thought, oh my goodness, this, is, this changes things. It's going to change the vibe a little bit, right? And so I've um, been praying for the people over there. I hope you are too. We're going to do that in a moment. But God kind of just gave me a whole new uh, message. And I feel like it's very relevant, but it's not exactly uh, the type of message that I'm used to, to doing. Um, you know, sometimes I come out and I'll say, you know, this is what we're talking about. I'll have a few points, you know, and, and those points, uh, they're, they're good. They're from God. They're from the word, you know, but sometimes I think they go over our head. Cause it's like, who wants to be told how to live their life? I, that's the last thing I want to do is tell you how to live your life. I don't, I don't know how, how you're supposed to live your life. It's your life, right? But I do know that there are truths in the Bible and I believe that this is kind of like a partnership between us. So I'm going to teach you the Bible, what it teaches and talk about the things in the Bible, talk about Jesus, and then you take these things and apply them. There are some lessons in the end that I will share with you that Jesus shares with us, but ultimately, uh, this is a a working situation where we are learning about God, and we're learning about our place in in his kingdom, right? And it is a wild time to be alive, isn't it? So let's pray, and... uh, we're going to get into it, all right? Father, thank you so much for, for who you are, for what you do. Thank you for being here today, God. Thank you for bringing your presence here, Lord. You always show up. Thank you. Help us not to take that for granted, Lord. You always show up. And Lord, when the enemy's moving, when uh, things are hard out there, Lord, when times are difficult, You always raise a standard that's higher. Lord, your grace is sufficient. It's more than enough. And so, God, we just thank you that you're with us. And I pray, Lord, that today these words would would plant seeds in our hearts and remind us of what is important and help us to commit to you during this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so uh, basically I'm just going to go through... The story of Jesus, like I said, the last week um, that he was in Jerusalem, which is also the last week of his life, up until almost until the point where he sits down with his disciples and tells him that uh, what's going to happen, and then and then the crucifixion story starts. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna be focused on uh, Matthew twenty one through twenty four. So I'm gonna kind of just go through and summarize most of it, but we'll read some scriptures. Cool, sound good. You guys in it? Anybody want to leave? Anybody want to walk out? Okay, all right, cool. All right, so we're going to start with Matthew uh, chapter 21. And uh, Jesus had just entered Jerusalem on uh, a donkey, and you got the palm branches. I mean, it, it was just Easter, so you guys, this should be fresh in your minds, right? Palm branches, people are saying Hosanna. And when he enters into the city that way, he is fulfilling a, a, a prophecy, and the people realize it, and they're excited that Jesus is here, the Messiah is here. He has followers. He has a lot of followers at this point, right? And so he comes in, and um, he's going to be there a week, okay? He's going to be there about a week. And his first stop is the temple. In this picture that we have up here, that's a picture of the temple. That's actually, um, 
That's actually a stock photo of a model that they have in Jerusalem. Really cool. But that's actually the temple. And um, it's not the real temple. Like, like they didn't take a photograph of it like 2,000 years ago. But it's the, it's the model, right? Does that make sense? So this was very uh, full of people. Um, there's a lot of things going on. There's a marketplace. Uh, there are people selling things at this time. And um, Jesus decides that he's going to head straight to the temple on day one. So let's look at Matthew 21, 12, when he gets there. It says, then Jesus entered the temple area and he drove out all those who were selling and buying on the temple grounds. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. So Jesus comes in straight, just goes straight to the temple and he causes a ruckus. He starts yelling, what are you guys doing in here? Why are you selling and buying things in this holy place that you call holy? And he was really upset and gave special attention to the money changers and to those selling pigeons, right? And I had to look this up. Why? Why, why did he give special attention to these people? Because they were ripping people off. They were stealing from the poor, People would come from all over. They would travel. They, would, they, they didn't have much. They would come from all over to go to the temple. And they, would, and they would come with money from their region. And they would change it, exchange it. And they were giving them you know, bad rates and putting interest on, on the exchanges. And they were selling them pigeons and ripping them off so that they could sacrifice, so they could worship. And so Jesus comes to the temple, causes a huge scene and then he leaves, and they go check into their Airbnb, right? <laughs> they go to a place called Bethany. Jesus says, hey, we're not going to stay right here because it might be a little, it might be, you know. He went in and he stirred up the people. He went in and he poked the, the, the bees hive, right? Like he, he really ticked them off. And so they, play, they stay in a place called Bethany. I'm going to uh, read you an excerpt of that. It says, Bethany is located on the southeastern slope of the Mount of Olives. So for Jesus to travel from Jerusalem to Bethany, he would have to he would he would he would have have had, excuse me, to leave the city, cross the Kidron Valley, climb the top of the Mount of Olives, cross the top of the mount and then descend down to the town. It was the perfect place for Jesus to stay. He would have been close to Jerusalem, but since Bethany faces the east, he probably could not even see Jerusalem from Bethany. So he's hiding out a little bit, right? But it's a long walk. And when they go to the top of, uh, when they leave the mountain, so there's two, basically two mountains. There's a mountain with the temple on top. The temple mount is on top of this mountain. And that's the same mountain that Isaac uh, went to sacrifice, or excuse me, Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac and God stopped him. And so it's a holy place. That's why the temple is built there. There's one mountain, and then there's another mountain, the Mount of Olives, right? And they're on the other side. And so, as he is in Bethany, uh, the, the disciples basically catch him uh, talking to a tree. Uh, he, he seems nuts at this point, right? He, he went into the temple, caused a huge ruckus. He goes to Bethany, now he's talking to a tree. There's a fig tree that doesn't produce fruit, and he tells that fig tree that, you're cursed. You'll never produce fruit because you're not producing fruit right now. And they ask him about it. What are you talking about? Why are you talking to that tree, Jesus? What's going on? And they're like concerned about Jesus at this point. And then he, he turns around and he talks to him about a mountain, right? Just like the one that they just come down from and, and went over, right? So look at Matthew 21, 21. It says, And Jesus answered and said to them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast in the sea, it'll happen. So they had to be confused, right? He's talking to this fig tree, and then he's talking about a mountain, and then he's talking about their faith, and they can just, well, what, what mountain? What are you talking about? Well, they had just been on top of the holy mountain, right? And... Jesus was talking about this fig tree that once produced fruit, and now it's not producing fruit anymore. He was talking about the temple. He was talking about this place that used to be holy. 
It used to be the way things were done. It used to be where God would show up and the people would, would find God and, and, and they would worship him there. But he was saying that it's, it's producing no fruit anymore. And it's going to be taken up. It's interesting, right? Look at Matthew 21, 23. So Jesus goes back to the temple the next day, right? And um, it says, when he entered the temple area, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him while he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you the authority? Who questions authority? Somebody who's afraid of losing their authority, right? Right? Jesus came and he was challenging their whole system. He was challenging the old ways of doing things because they weren't doing it right. They weren't honoring God. They had their little system. It worked for them. It was a system where it kept the people in power in power and it kept the people that were poor. It kept them in a place where they had to keep begging and keep coming to them, right? And so look at Matthew 21, 23 through 27. Okay, I already read, uh, I already read the verse, sorry. Uh, next, next verse, 24, or 25. This is the baptism of John was from what source? This is the question that Jesus asked him. So they ask him, you know, by what authority are you doing this? And he says, I'll, let me ask you a question, and then if you answer that, I will tell you what authority, right? So he says, the baptism of John was from what source? From heaven or from men? And they began, this is important, guys, they began considering the implications among themselves. So they had to go back and like do a little powwow, right? And it says, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, then why did you not believe him? But if we say from men, we fear the people, okay? Think about that. They fear the people. It says, they, for they all regard John as a prophet. And answering Jesus, they said, we don't know. Okay, these are the religious uh, elite. These are the people that should know everything. They should be able to answer such a simple question very easily. But they can't answer a simple question. They have to come back and say, we do not know. Let me tell you why. Because they had an agenda. And their agenda was more important than the truth to them. See, we're living in a world today where we are being pressured to pick a side. Follow this agenda. Follow this group. And then fight the other group. And that whole system, I'm telling you right now, that whole system is based on control. Controlling you and it's based on power. It's what it's based on. And not power for us. And so Jesus basically calls them, he's he's rolling in and he's threatening these leaders that have their way. And because of their agendas, they come off like blubbering, you know what, right? Have you noticed like these days that people are asked some pretty simple questions in the news and different places and they just, they, their answers are just like moronic. You're like, where did, that is not even close to a good answer or the right answer. And it's because they have to impress the people around them. They have to impress the people that they've committed themselves to, right? They haven't committed to the truth. They've committed to a political idea or party, right? So Matthew 21, 32, read that. For John came, this is uh, Jesus kind of explaining. This is, and, and when he talks about John, he's not talking about the Apostle John, just so you guys know. He's talking about John the Baptist, who um, was baptizing people by the Jordan River. And so if you go to Israel, um, there's, there's Galilee right up here. Uh, there's like a lake. And then the Jordan River kind of flows down. If you look at a map, you'll see this. And then, and then John the Baptist was baptizing people down at the bottom of a mountain that you would climb up to go to Jerusalem. It actually kind of, I, I, I drew out the, uh, the path that they would take from, from Galilee to Jerusalem, and it made a J. Jesus was pretty slick. All right, so... Um, John came to you in the way of the righteous, uh, and, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes did believe him. And you, seeing this, did not even have second thoughts afterwards so as to believe him. See what's happening? The people that have nothing to lose, the people that don't have to impress other people, are, getting, are, are able to see the truth. Because they're not in prison, they're not anchored by other people's opinions and other people's thoughts. 
They're already at the bottom, man. They're like, hey, whatever. I just, I'm ready to hear the, the right stuff. I'm ready to hear the truth. And so they are the ones that Jesus talks about when he says the last will be first. Right? Matthew 21, uh, 43 through 46. Therefore, Jesus says, um, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, to the, taken away from the religious leaders and given to a people producing its fruit, right? And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces and on whomever uh, it falls, it will crush him. When the, pre, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they understood that he was speaking about them. And although they sought to arrest him, they what? Feared the crowds, right? Since they considered him to be a prophet. So the next um, few paragraphs, there's a parable of the marriage feast. Really good. You should read that. Um, but I'm not going to go over that. Uh, then the next part, Jesus basically says that we have to pay our taxes tomorrow. Then we go on to uh, Matthew 22, 34 through 40. And uh, let's just read that. I'm read it from my Bible here. By the way, when I'm staring at these screens, the verses are on there for me. That's why I'm reading them. In case you guys are wondering, I'm not just like staring at the ground. And, and I've always wondered if you guys thought that was weird. I don't know. Um, all right, so Matthew 22, 34 through 40. This is, um, this is like the part where Jesus really, really, really uh, exposes the cracks in the Pharisees and the Sadducees' systems. The Pharisees and the Sadducees are the big uh, political group of the day, right? They both belong to the Sanhedrin, uh, which is under Roman rule. And so there's, there's Pharisees and there's Sadducees. They don't really like each other but they do unify on one thing, right? They, they don't like Jesus at all because Jesus is, is challenging their way of life. And so they keep coming back, they keep coming to him. The Sadducees come, they try to stump him. The Pharisees come, they try to stump him. And uh, in verse 34 of 22, the Pharisees, uh, they came to him. It says, when the Pharisees heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they gathered themselves together and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Now, it's interesting. This, this passage or this idea of loving your neighbor and loving God, I've seen it, I've seen it attacked lately by so-called Christians, I've seen them say, it's not all about love. Sometimes you gotta blah, 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 right? Well, Jesus just now says right here in my Bible, he says it's all about love. That's what he says. Now, is there fighting in love? Yeah, but there's the right way to do it. Is there winning in love? Yeah, absolutely. Is there influence in love? You betcha. More influence and love than there is in anything else on the planet. It's powerful, right? It's not just cupids floating around. It's powerful. So when Jesus tells them that, they have nothing to say. They have nothing to say. They can't, they can't argue that, love God. They can't come back and say, well, uh, okay, you got me, right? And he crushes their whole system. And what he does when, when he crushes their system he takes their power away again, and he basically tells the people, you don't need that. You don't need them. You don't need to follow their ways. You don't need to be a part of that group. You'll never belong anyway, because you're not them. They've created this system to make sure that you'll never be them. Jesus gives power back to the people, doesn't he? Under God, of course. Because there is a difference between the people having all the power and not being under God. That's, that's not good. But when the people are under God and they're working with him, that is good, right? Uh, Matthew 23, it says, um, Jesus basically lays in to, uh, a, to two groups, the Pharisees and the scribes. 
the Pharisees and scribes, you know, this is interesting. It gets confusing because there's all these different groups, right? So let me, let me just read, read to you the, uh, a part of this book. I, I had this book on my bookshelf for literally like 10 years, and I've read like none of it. I haven't, <laughs> I just, I bought it. Church history, yes, I need to learn that. <laughs> Can we cut that out, guys? Like edit that out? Okay, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> nope, it's live stream. Okay, cool. Um, so this book, it's been on my shelf for a couple years. I haven't even read it. I, I grabbed it, and I have multiple books on church history, um, and, and for some reason, this one just kind of stepped out to me, or stuck out to me. And so I'm just going to read you this. It says, uh, so the Romans were in power during the day, right? Like Rome had, they were like uh, taking over. You, you know how like Russia is taking over Ukraine right now? Like it's, well, imagine they just keep going and they take over all these other countries. Like that's what Rome did. They took over all these countries. They were the power of the day and they were in charge, Right. And because of that, there were little factions that rose up, little groups that rose up, right? And it says this. One group, the Pharisees, they emphasized that those uh, Jewish traditions and practices that set them apart from pagan culture. Their name means separated ones. And they prided themselves on their, on their strict observance of every detail of the Jewish law and their extreme intolerance of people they considered ritually unclean. This piety and patriotism one respect amongst the people. So the Pharisees are the group that are traditionalists. They're holding on to their traditionals, traditional values, uh, but they, um, they see themselves as better than other people. They say, you know, we're doing it right, you're not doing it right. They wore the certain robes and they did the certain things that other people didn't do. They looked down on people. So that's the Pharisees, right? Last service I said the Pharisees were Republicans and I, and I, and I, and I took that back immediately. Um, On the other hand, some Jews found Roman rule a distinct advantage. Uh, among them were members of Jerusalem's aristocracy. From this small group of, of wealthy, pedigreed families came high priests and the lesser priests who controlled the temple. Many of them enjoyed sophisticated manners and fashions of the Greco-Roman uh, culture. Some even took their names. Their interests were represented by the conservative political group known as the Sadducees. And at that time of Jesus, these men controlled the high Jewish council of the Sanhedrin. But they had less influence among the common people. So there's two different groups. And they're not Republicans, Democrats, but they're very similar. It's like a, um, uh, the two political parties of the day. And yes, they're also religious leaders. So just imagine these two different groups fighting with each other but uniting on certain things, right? So... Um, there's another party, the Zealots, and they were bent on armed resistance to all Romans in the fatherland. They looked back two centuries to the glorious days of the Maccabees when religious zeal combined with the ready sword to overthrow the pagan overload. So there's these Zealots who are like, we're just going to take matters in our own hands. We're going to go up in the hills and have our guns and we're going to handle this, right? Then there's a third group, or a fourth group, sorry, called the Essenes who had little or no interest in politics or warfare. Instead, they just withdrew to the Judean wilderness. I think, I think that's my group. I'm just, let's just get out of town, right? So then you um, have the, the uh, scribes. And the scribes were lawmakers. They were, uh, some of them were Pharisees, and they were um, the people who wrote laws. They wrote laws, right? Just like our uh, congressmen, just like our, the people that are in our government do. And so in 23, now the reason this is all important is because Jesus, he goes after the Pharisees and he goes after the scribes, but he leaves the Sadducees out of this next part. And he goes at them hard. He says in verse 23 too, he says, the scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore, all that they uh, tell you to observe, but they do not, they, but do not do according to their deeds, for they say things and do not do them. And then he goes and, and, and lists all the things that they say that you should do, but they don't do them. Basically, they were putting more burdens on the people's back. Now, should a leader put more burdens on the people's back? No. Leaders should do the opposite. Leaders should take burdens off of people's backs. They should help people, right? And that's not what they were doing. But... All along, they were also pretending to be the righteous ones. They were pretending to be the ones who, who spoke for God. They were, the, they were uh, God's mouthpiece, so to speak, right? 
But the Sadducees, on the other hand, they, they, they just kind of were honest about who they were. And they said, yeah, we, you know, we're, uh, we're, just, we're with the Romans because they're really in charge. And we're just going to you know, do our thing and, and stay with them. So Jesus kind of stayed back and didn't really attack them. In verse 13 to 23, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. You guys are hypocrites. In other words, they're pretending to be someone that they're not, right? It's interesting, all of this. We live in a society that could be amazing. Like this country, and this country is amazing, right? Like we have, we still have our freedom. I was, I was, uh, driving here this morning and I was looking around and it's, it was beautiful this morning. It hadn't started raining yet. It, was, it looks like it's starting to clear up out there. And I was thinking, man, like what a peaceful morning. And then I thought about the people that are in Israel right now and how they had a really rough couple of nights, right? Could you imagine uh, getting a uh, notice on your phone at midnight saying that there are hundreds of rockets and drones uh, flying your way, uh, flying right to our country, um, and then trying to sleep? No. So I'm thankful for where I'm at right now. I'm thankful for what I have right now. And, I, and I'm going to pray for the people of Israel. I'm going to pray for everybody over there on both sides of the conflict. And, and hopefully God can reveal his son, his true Son to them, Lord. And, and I, I, I'm going to be praying that that would happen. But we do live in a country that is going in a direction that makes me nervous. And I'm not going to get into politics, okay, because this is a church, but I will talk about church. There are churches all over that are starting to speak political agendas from the pulpit. They're starting to tell people what to vote, how to vote, how to fight, fight the other side, the other side's wrong. Let me tell you right now, that degrades the gospel of Jesus Christ. Degrades, right? Now, I'm not saying that politics aren't important. Yes, vote, yes, get involved, do your thing. Be, you know, be political. Yes, politics are very important, especially local politics. I've been thinking about that lately. Like, local politics are very important. It's good to be involved. But pol politicians, the good ones, right, are there to serve the people of the community. And that's what that's about. But this is about something bigger. This is about something else, right? This is about the God who created the universe. This is about Jesus Christ who died for all of our sins, for everyone. No matter your political belief, no matter who you are, if you're in here today and you're a Democrat, you're welcome. You are welcome here. If you're here and you're a Republican, you're welcome here. If you're here and you don't know what you are, you are welcome here. <laughs> Which is probably most, most of us these days, right? It's like the choices that we have are like bad, the best of the, the, best of the worst. Jesus goes on and... Um, Trying to think of time here. Um, but he goes on and he prophesies that this system that, he, that they see that's alive and well, where there's the religious leaders and they're, they're uh, oppressing people and, and you know, it doesn't look like anything's ever going to change. He prophesies that this whole system is going to crash down. He even prophesies the temple is going to crash down. And you know what? A few, a few years after... Um, uh, a couple decades after Jesus dies, the entire system is gone. The entire system. The temple burns down, the people scatter, and, and that's that. But in the process of that falling down, of that crumbling, of that being destroyed, he raises up something that is so much better and so much bigger. And I, I, I kind of think that that's what he's doing now. I'm not saying that that our country is going to be destroyed or anything. I don't know what's going to happen, okay? I, I, I don't know. My dad gets into all this uh, prophecy stuff and end time stuff, and he's really good at that stuff. I'm not great at that stuff. Um, but I do see that we are headed in a place to where the system is broken and something needs to change, right? And for us, where we, even though we might be politically motivated outside of here, 
We are number one Christians. That's who we are. And don't ever forget that. Make sure that our priorities are set straight. Yes, you can be political, but make sure that God is at the top. Make sure that you test everything against his word, right? When you're talking to somebody about an issue, talk to them about what the Bible says about it. Talk to them about what God is putting on your heart to say about it, right? That lines up with his word. And so I'm going to end with uh, 24. I'm just going to skip over there. This is the part where Jesus gives us some instructions. And throughout this whole time, he's just been fighting kind of with the religious leaders. But in 24, he gives his disciples, and I believe us also, instructions. And I'll just read, uh, I'll just read through it because it'll make more sense. Okay, so 24, 4 through 14. And Jesus said, answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. That's the first instruction. See to it that no one misleads you. How do you do that? How do you, how do you make sure that no one misleads you? By putting him at number one. By not having an agenda that's above him. When your eyes are on God and on, and on what he wants, then you're going to know. And when you anchor every truth, every you know, so-called, so-called truth that you hear, when you uh, compare it to the word, you're going to know what's true and what's not. Right? So don't let anybody mislead you. Stay connected to what the word says. Stay connected to your church body. Stay connected through prayer with God, right? So the first thing is, is make sure that you're not misled. Verse 5 says, and many will come in my name. Many will come say, I, saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. You know, I, I was just watching this documentary on uh, Netflix. I'm not promoting it, but uh, my wife was watching it. She's like, you got to see this. And um, it was called Escaping Twin Flames. Nobody? Okay, cool. Um, well, this guy, it's, it's like a cult documentary. This guy it basically um, tricks a bunch of people. This guy in this documentary, this cult leader, said he was Jesus Christ. And it was so, and it was so subtle. And, and I thought, oh, that's how they come. Because I, I always thought that they would come, you know, these people that say they're the Christ, that they would come wearing like a Jesus robe and have long hair, and, and they would just be walking around the street saying, I'm Jesus, right? No, it's, it's, it's more subtle than that. It's trickier than that. Right? And, and people believe these people because they are manipulative, because they give them what they think they want. And so it says that many will come and, and will mislead many. And you will be hearing of wars. Okay? Listen to this. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened. Wars and rumors of wars. Don't be scared about that. Don't be worried about that. Because we have eternity. Right? We have God. I mean, I know it's easy to say, and I know that if I'm in Israel and my kids are scared and they're not sleeping, that I, I know it's a different situation over there than it is here, and that might be the situation over here someday, but I had an epiphany, epiphany this morning about that. I was driving to church, and, and, and as I saw the beautiful landscape and, and the, the, the clouds in the sky and the sun peeking through, I saw this homeless, maybe homeless man, I'm not sure, I'm assuming I shouldn't do that, but this guy was just walking and his back was bent all the way and he was, and he was in pain and he was walking. And I was thinking to myself, there's pain even when everything is okay. There's pain when everything is good. You know what that tells me? It tells me that there's a spiritual battle going on here that we can't even see. And whether there's an actual war behind it or not, there's no difference. We have pains. We have issues. We have things that we're dealing with here. They have things they're dealing with there. The only difference is their priorities get straightened up pretty fast when the actual planes are flying over your head, right? But there's no difference. Our priorities should be in place as well because the spiritual war is true. And the way that you fight is is you stay on your knees, right? 
Verse 6 says, and you will be hearing, oh, I already read that, uh, wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not frightened. For those things must take place. But that is not the end. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famine and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you. And you will be hated by all nations on account of my name. And at, the, and at that time, many will fall away and will deliver up one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and mislead many. And because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. Let me read that again. Because lawlessness increases, right, most people's love will grow cold. That's when we're looking around at what everyone else isn't doing. When everyone else isn't picking up the ball and doing their part, right? We're like, man, they don't care. Why should I? You should care because you're not playing ball for them. You're playing ball for the Lord, right? You should care because, because he's still with you. And he told us this would happen, right? Verse 13, but the one who endures to the end, and that's the third instruction, the one who endures to the end shall be saved. And this is the gospel of the kingdom. And this, excuse me, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a witness to all the nations. Now the gospel of the the kingdom, the kingdom he's talking about is the kingdom of heaven, which which is where our loyalty lies. Okay? So when it comes to politics, pray about who you're supposed to vote for. Pray about how you're supposed to be involved. And I believe God will lead you to be involved however you're supposed to be involved. But remember that God is always number one. And in this church, he always will be. He'll be number one above politics. Because in the end, Joe Biden ain't going to save you. And in the end, Donald Trump ain't going to save you. Jesus Christ is the only one. Right? So... Let's pray this. Father, we thank you for everything you're doing, Lord. And I pray that you would give our congregation, all of us, the people that are in in this church, I pray that you give us the ability to trust you, to let go, to cease striving and know that you are God. And I pray, Lord, that you would move on our hearts to make the decisions that we need to make, Lord, to commit, recommit to you if need be to commit to you for the first time if need, if need be and help us to live the life, Lord, where we, we trust you and we live under you. Help us to endure. Help us to be strong. Help us to understand that the blessings that we have are gifts and we need to be happy for those blessings, but we also need to know that when the hard times come, you're with us. Thank you, Lord. If anybody wants to come up and recommit or commit their lives to Christ today, come up and get prayer from these prayer people up front. They have prayed already today and they are ready for you. They've prayed for you before you even came here this morning. So church, amen. Love you guys. Have a great Sunday. Don't get too caught up in the news. Pray for the people of Israel, okay? Lord bless those people in Jesus name, amen. Hey church, my name is Kenzie and thank you for joining us today for VBF Online. You can visit our website at vbf.org to watch our latest sermons, follow us on social media and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you'd like to donate to our ministry, you can do so by going to vbf.org and clicking the Tithe Here tab, or you can mail in a check. If you have a God story you'd like to share, you can email us at share at vbf.org. Thank you for joining us today and we hope you enjoy the message.